Dark Souls is a game about wanting to climb back into your mom's womb, getting your dick cut off, and being endlessly miserable. I am completely serious about this. I'm Jared, and welcome to this Wisecrack Edition on the Dark Souls series. Dark Souls. Fighting. Magic. Fantasy. And perhaps, most importantly, infinite frustration. Not only is the gameplay excruciatingly difficult, the storyline is incredibly cryptic. It really is impossibly baffling. Namco has even offered $10,000 to anyone who can explain the story. Many have tried to puzzle it out, but their efforts have only yielded more of what the game already doles out in spades. Feelings of defeat and utter frustration. But what if we're looking in the wrong places? What if the so-called plot is just a distraction? Humor me for a second. A story that deliberately leads nowhere may seem silly to some of you who read every item description and obsess about lore, but it's not as uncommon as you might think. Pioneering Italian filmmaker Michelangelo Antonioni, for example, did this constantly. In his most famous film, Blow Up, the audience is seduced by a tale of intrigue when a photographer accidentally stumbles upon evidence of a murder in one of his photographs. Warning, art film spoilers ahead. Oh, you wanted to know who the murderer was and why it happened? Too bad we never find out. The plot was a distraction. The movie is actually a character study about a narcissistic artist mired by ennui. Or his film La Aventura, about a woman who goes missing during a Mediterranean boating trip. Oh, you wanted to know what happened to her? Too bad, you'll never find out. The film is actually about the hollow decadence of her spoiled friends. Now you might be thinking that these practices are fine and dandy for an avant-garde filmmaker, but games? Really? I ask you to note that we're not dealing with just any game developer here. The man behind Dark Souls is the enigmatic and elusive video game maestro Hidetaka Miyazaki. Just as Antonioni created meaning through character, today we're going to argue that Miyazaki creates meaning in Dark Souls through visual design. For instance, at the beginning of Dark Souls 2, we see an old lady spinning yarn at a sewing machine. If you're trying to find clarity in what she says, ha, good luck. But if you just focus on the visuals, you'll notice that Miyazaki is making a reference to the Norns of Norse mythology, old women who spin the yarns of fate. See? Now we're getting somewhere. Although the sparse dialogue may not point to any kind of narrative clarity, think back deep into your past. It still echoes the game's thematic core. At least you know your own name. Indeed, the game seems to be about piecing together a broken past and figuring out who we are. At the character creation screen, the game even deliberately prompts you with the question, is this your true self? Dark Souls is a nightmarish descent into the unconscious, where it explores our identity and our deepest desires. Part one, back to the womb. Let's start at the beginning. The first Dark Souls begins with a visual birthing scene. The camera plunges into a crevice that, let's face it, is deliberately shaped like a vagina, through a tunnel that is not unlike an ovary, and into a pit that resembles a womb, which is full of things being born. Yes, we're absolutely going there. At the beginning of Dark Souls 2, we have a similar scene, only this time structured in reverse. We begin the game inside a labyrinth of tunnels, tubes, and caverns, and we have to work our way out till we go through a vagina-like crevice into the light. This tutorial section of the game takes place in the womb, and when we are developed enough, we get out. And now that we're born, we can begin our quest. These images are not just at the start of the games either. The landscapes often appear womb and ovary-like, and in Dark Souls 1, the essential item humanity is very deliberately vagina-shaped. The word itself makes some men uncomfortable. Vagina. In fact, Dark Souls 2 is full of mother symbols from the start. Hmm. Yonic, or vagina-like imagery, is quite common in popular media. Whether it's Fight Club, Rick and Morty, the Alien franchise, or Videodrome, artists know they can always turn to everybody's favorite orifice when trying to implement themes of birth, rebirth, and, well, sex. Even when we escape the womb, the game continues to abound with further images of birth. We find a mysterious nest and eggs that transport you to other places. We visit the demon ruins, which are covered with hideous egg monsters. We can even get infected with a horrible egg head. We encounter pregnant monsters hidden in cells, as if we have repressed them. In Bloodborne, characters talk about the bloody scenes of birth and the screams of pregnant women as you collect parts of an umbilical cord to put back together. The game finishes with a bizarre Lovecraftian baby alien. The blood dregs look suspiciously like semen, various creatures have various births, and some have even speculated that the blood that we drink in the game could be menstrual. Of course, the title Bloodborne perhaps says it all. 
But instead of the common trope of having a freaky alien within us, we are the creatures moving around the alien womb world. The question is, are we trying to get out or back in? We don't seem to want to escape this womb, and we keep plunging deeper within it, trying to get to the secrets held inside these depths. There, that hole. Take a closer look. While tomb raiding is a familiar trope in video games, womb raiding is something unique to Dark Souls. So why this obsession with birth? Well, it goes back to the fact that this is a game about lost identity, and about working out who we really are. Sometimes I feel obsessed with this insignificant thing called self. Game-changing psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud thought that because we all find our own identities so complex and hard to understand, we look back to our very origins trying to figure out who we are, all the way back to the time we spent in our mother's womb. Actually, Freud says, we look back even further to our very first moment, the moment our parents had sex. Ay, caramba! Freud calls this the primal scene, the event which started us, and that, according to him, we always dream of. The first line of Dark Souls 2 is, perhaps you've seen it, maybe in a dream a murky, forgotten land. The premise of the game is how to get back to this murky, forgotten land which we can never remember. An endless search for our identity. Part 2 castration. But just because re-entering our mom's womb is impossible, it doesn't stop us from trying, metaphorically at least. One of the opening shots of Dark Souls 2 is a hand desperately reaching for a mother. We often have a crack at getting into our moms, but as Freud explains, social taboos prevent us from ever accessing them in this way again. For Freud, it is the father who says no and prevents us from getting access to the mom, once again, metaphorically. Dark Souls is full of metaphorical moments like this, where we are confronted with an arched doorway which we want to access only to have our path blocked by a series of male guards with big, erect, throbbing, uh, weapons. It's pretty impossible to ignore that we're dealing with castrators blocking us from entering crevice-like passages. In fact, the vast majority of enemies in the game are guards, and it's not entirely clear what they're guarding and why. The guards, from monsters to suits of armor, are almost exclusively castrating figures wielding large, sharp swords, spears, halberds, and other phallic weaponry. There's even a boss in Demon Souls called the Penetrator, who, you know, sticks it to you good. For Freud, swords are always the symbol of castration. Like our fathers, these enemies threaten to cut off our dicks as we attempt to get to the mother, metaphorically. Now, if you've played one of these games, chances are you've seen this screen once, twice, or maybe 500 times. The average person sees this deflating message an incredible 739 times in the course of completing Dark Souls 2. You die a lot, and as such, the game creates a feeling of being a constant failure. This sense of impotence is exactly the atmosphere of Freudian castration. You know that final giving up when you have a great sigh of defeat, put the controller down, and slope off to bed? You've been castrated and are filled with impotent failure. Nothing quite deflates your manhood like being destroyed by a hulking male giant wielding a formidable phallus. Really, does the sword have to be that big? These guys make Cloud Strife look like a bitch. On top of He-Men packing huge dongs, the game also features some interesting depictions of women enemies. When we approach Scorpionus Najka in Dark Souls 2, you might be thinking, oh damn, she's kinda hot, I wonder what's below the- oh shit! An attractive top half, but weaponized bottom half can also be seen in Myth of the Baneful. Another major female enemy, Queen Quilog, has monstrous teeth in place of a vagina, sending the message that trying to re-enter the womb is the ultimate social taboo. Don't go there, or you'll get bitten. This classic symbol of castration is rooted in the concept of the vagina dentata, literally meaning a vagina with teeth. The vagina dentata began as an ancient folklore tale, but then became an important concept to philosophy and eventually psychoanalysis. It's the idea of a vagina with secretly hidden ferocious penis decapitating fangs. In previous centuries, prohibiting fathers even made chastity belts with metal teeth to make this terrifying myth a reality. Thus, in Dark Souls, we've got a visual embodiment of Freud's idea of castration anxiety. The idea is to show us our desire, and then, instead of letting that desire be fulfilled, attack and symbolically castrate us, leaving us weak and unfulfilled. Part 3. Endless Misery and Frustration The ending of Dark Souls 2 reverses the birthing scene at the beginning. Going through the very obviously vagina-like door, the hero is welcomed back into the seat at the heart of the mother's womb by a comforting female voice. Take your throne. The throne we sit on is even based on a kiln a type of oven. Kilns have been associated with wombs throughout history. You know how pregnant women sometimes say they have a bun in the oven? Well, there you go. The throne here is called the throne of want. It is the embodiment of ultimate desire, the place where we have our deepest and most repressed wishes fulfilled. Tell me what you desire. 
To get there, you have to defeat more penis-wielding giant alpha males. Finally, our hero sits in the throne of want and feels something we all want, satisfaction. satisfaction. But how do we feel as the player of the game? Are we now fulfilled along with our character? It's unlikely. I mean, what the hell just happened? Why did I spend 60 hours grinding my teeth to finally sit my ass down on this fucking throne with just more vague dialogue? The curse wasn't even lifted. Wasn't that the whole point? Indeed, we feel frustrated again. Ultimately, we'll never work out the puzzle of our desires or our identities. The mysterious female voice even says, souls will flourish anew and all of this will play out again. Souls will flourish anew and all of this will play out again. The most influential follower of Freud was fellow psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan, who argued that we can never be fulfilled because as soon as we get what we want, we stop wanting it. Kevin Spacey explains this idea. The moment, the second that you get what you seek, you don't, you can't want it anymore. He coveted what he did not have, and it drove him mad. In Dark Souls 2, the ancient dragon even tells us this Lacanian argument directly, that the curse of life is the curse of want. We are destined to forever be unfulfilled, always unsatisfied. Conclusion. On a rare occasion when Miyazaki commented on the Dark Souls series, he said the games are about the strange crossover between life and death. He says he wants his games to explore questions like, what is death? And for that matter, what is life? Looked at through this lens, Dark Souls can be considered a metaphor for life itself. In Dark Souls 2, you are developed in the womb, then you are born, then you are plagued with endless desire, frustration, and misery until you confront death, and through death, you return to the peaceful oblivion of your mother's womb. Dark Souls visualizes our horrific unconscious desires, our complicated relationship with birth, and our endless failure to be fulfilled with a nightmarish flair. And despite all that, I'm still jazzed as hell for Dark Souls 3. Hey guys, as always, thanks for watching. We wanted to throw a special shout out to our collaborator on this video, the Dark Souls master himself, Vati Vidya. He makes quality videos all about narrative interpretations of Dark Souls 1, 2, 3, Demon Souls, and Bloodborne. Vati Vidya helped us get a ton of the footage you saw in this episode, and we literally couldn't have pulled it off without him, so thank you. Light this bonfire to visit Vati Vidya's channel page, subscribe while you're over there, and tell him Wisecrack sent you. And if you like this episode, you should check out our other videos too. Click on this very suggestive piece of humanity to go to our channel page where you can find more of our brain tickling videos and subscribe. I promise we won't bite. As you can imagine, our videos take a lot of effort and a long time to make. It takes an entire team of people to bring these episodes to life. Gamers, writers, researchers, academics, filmmakers, artists, editors, audio engineers, and yes, even interns. We're lucky to work with some of the most talented folks out there who put their heart and soul into making sure that every video we release is as smart and entertaining as it can be. So show your love by clicking through to our channel page and subscribing. All right, we've got tons of work to do in other videos. Catch you next time.